All right, so um, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Eric Shoebridge, who joined us all the way from Canada um, at McGill University, uh, where he is a uh, leading uh, mitochondrial uh, researcher. Thanks, Marnie, and thank you to the group. I'll push the talk. Nothing's starting. You'll, you'll get a green light in a second, yeah. Okay. But go ahead, we go. sorry, you get extra time that way. <laughs> I don't need time. I didn't make any slides. I think I've never given a talk without slides since I've been a professor, at least. That's for sure. Is your mic but, on? Uh, uh, sorry? My we're not mic? sure we're hearing you. Okay, sorry. Oh, there you go. I need to stand yeah, be, a little closer to the mic. Thank you. So as Marty said, I've come all the way from Canada. It's about an hour and 15 minutes from Montreal. <laughs> uh, so I'm, as a Canadian, we have one foot in the Commonwealth camp and one foot in the North American camp. So uh, usually we're called honest brokers <laughs> in these kind of processes. So I showed up at immigration and they asked me what I was going to do uh, in Washington, because they always do. I actually, with the fr I, there's a, a small story, I'll, I'll take 30 seconds of my time. I came to the FDA panel on this, what, 10 or 12 years ago, the very first one, and I actually had to sign all these documents because I was made a temporary employee of the U.S. government. And I went to the Commissioner of Oaths in Montreal and I had to swear allegiance to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America against enemies foreign and domestic. And they said, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> I had to do it twice for two separate documents, and so I phoned the people at the FDA, and I said, so I get up to the border, what should I do? And she said, oh, just say you're going to see friends. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I came, and the guy said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to give a short presentation at this uh, meeting that's looking at the investigation of three parent families. And he said, oh, you mean polygamy? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, 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 it's not polygamy. So I said, you know any biology? So I gave him my 10 minute talk. <laughs> Other people were waiting in line. So I guess uh, I'm supposed to talk about the bottleneck. So we've worked on this a little bit uh, in animal models. Uh, and I thought maybe I'd do two things to talk about the known knowns maybe the known unknowns, and in 10 minutes I don't think I can get to the unknown unknowns there. But I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what we know. So the history of it, people, uh, Bill Houseworth, I think, William Houseworth was the, probably the first guy who seriously looked at mammalian oocytes to look at mitochondrial DNA copy numbers, mitochondria. Uh, and he looked at Holstein cows probably almost 50 years ago now, maybe 45 years ago. He now makes adenovirus for gene therapy of people with retinal diseases. So he got completely out of the business. And what he found at the time was there was a couple hundred thousand copies, he thought, of mitochondrial DNA based on southern blot data in mammalian oocytes and about a couple of hundred thousand mitochondria. So mitochondria were organized with about one genome. And the nucleoid structure in mitochondria that packages mitochondrial DNA then just packages a single genome. So the people, there's a fair amount of discussion now about <coughs> what effect nucleoid structures have on mitochondrial DNA segregation or transmission. And I think that's maybe not something we have to worry too much about in about mitochondria in oocytes or zygotes or embryos, whatever you want to call them, because they're probably packaged as a single one per mitochondria, roughly one or two. Uh, mitochondria are kind of wimpy in oocytes. They don't have very many, they don't have much ultrastructure. They look like kind of pale imitations of mitochondria in, say, heart tissue or neurons or things like that. And there's a lot of them. There's at least a couple of hundred thousand. And human uh, mitochondrial DNA copy numbers have been estimated from people in IVF clinics, and it ranges from a couple hundred thousand to maybe 800,000. So that may be a bit of a biased sample. We don't really know what it is, but there's a lot of them. And it's clear the oocyte doesn't need that many mitochondria for energy. Uh, and what we think it is is just a genetic way to distribute mitochondria to the developing embryo. So um, they, as I said, the segregation for all intents and purposes could be treated like segregating single mitochondria or single mitochondrial DNAs, we think. So why do, why do you need that? Uh, well, replication of the mitochondrial genome doesn't begin until, at least in animal models, and I, I'm not sure if there are really any good data on this in humans, until roughly after the implantation of the embryo. So you start off with a couple of hundred thousand copies of mitochondrial DNA and you simply divide them up into all the early cells of the embryo. So you need to start with a very large number. Uh, and here we get to the, one of the known unknowns. Nobody knows why. Nobody knows why the mitochondrial DNA does not divide during that stage. Of course, nuclear DNA replication is going like gangbusters because you're making lots of cells. But mitochondria are sitting there. Mitochondrial DNA are just sitting there doing not much of anything. And it might be because they're in an extremely hypoxic environment uh, until they implant, until they actually get a blood supply. And so there's really nothing 
they don't have any fuel, as it were, they don't have any oxygen, and maybe when they implant, oxygen could be the signal to start them re-replicating. So they go down to a relatively small number. You need a couple of hundred thousand, and if you do the calculation in the mouse, you'll end up with about 100 copies or so, or 50 copies per cell, because you can count the number of cells in an early mouse embryo at that stage, and, and that's been done. So if you start off with a much lower number, you could end up having cells with no mitochondria, no mitochondrial DNA. So we think that's just simply a genetic trick a mechanism, if you will, not a trick, a mechanism that evolved to randomly distribute them in the absence of mitochondrial replication. So mitochondrial replication then restarts in the early embryo and a bunch of cells, and in the mouse it's about 50 odd cells are set aside that are called primordial germ cells that are going to give rise to the gametes in the next generation. And I think there's been some discussion, there's some discussion in the literature about how many copies of mitochondrial DNA exist in those cells. And there's one group that kind of disagrees with the other groups. I'm one of the other groups and, as the, and the group at Newcastle more or less come to the same number. It's about 200 mitochondria and 200 mitochondrial DNAs. So there's about a 1,000 fold reduction in the number of genomes from the oocyte to the cells, the primordial germ cells that will give rise to all the gametes in the next, all the oocytes in the next generation. So there is, that's, that is a physical bottleneck. Whether that represents the only bottleneck uh, in transmission of mitochondrial DNA, I think it's still a little bit up for grabs. Uh, my own lab produced some data suggesting that later on in very early postnatal life, there's some evidence for uh, replication of a subpopulation of genomes, which would be a further sampling process during that. So I think it's fair to say that most people agree that the effective number of segregating units that are transmitted from one generation to the next is roughly 200. So it's roughly the same size as the physical bottleneck ballpark. And there, you can estimate this in a number of ways. <laughs> the way we did it early on when we made the first animal model was to look at the variance in moms and the variance in all their pups and estimate how many samples you would have had to take to produce that variance in the next generation. And that came out to be about 200. And if we looked at all the pedigrees that were segregating pathogenic mutations that were known at the time, we got roughly the same number doing the same kind of a calculation. And I don't think anybody's come up with anything that's dramatically different, although there's a few papers that I, that I have, haven't scoured through that have recently appeared in the literature using next-gen sequencing data, which claim to find levels of heteroplasmy that are extremely low. Uh, I worry a little bit about whether we're on the, you know, whether they're errors, whether they're sequencing errors or whether that's, whether that's real heteroplasmy. So effectively, the conclusion of this is that for many mitochondrial DNA mutations, and deletions are excluded from this, but some tRNA point mutations, for instance, segregate uh, completely randomly in the next generation. They go through this bottleneck, and so what you end up with uh, in the embryo in the children is unpredictable. Uh, and it can go. I mean, I think David Thorburn's done the best analysis of this in Melbourne on a on a actually a protein coding mutation. <laughs> and if you look at the uh, the average risk of somebody of a mom carrying 50 percent is around what she's got. But if you look at the confidence limits, it goes from zero to 100. So essentially, you can't counsel anybody sensibly because there's a, a, there's a very strong chance you might end up with somebody who doesn't have any mutations or somebody who has got a lot and has a severe phenotype. Deletions are a different story, and I think they don't get transmitted not because they can't be transmitted, it's because women who are carrying a large proportion don't reproduce. And so women who are carrying a small proportion of deletion mutants have oocytes that have rare oocytes that have proportions, some, a significant proportion of deletions in them. Uh, and that's why the relative risk is so low, because mice can transmit them perfectly well. Uh, the mice just don't get sick. They reproduce if they have a high proportion of the mutants. Um, what else to say? Um, so I think the, the, when we've made the first animal model, so I guess maybe it's, it might be important to address this issue about what happens if you use this technique and you carry over a few percent of mitochondrial genomes that are carrying this mutant to the embryo that will be implanted. So when we did the very first mouse on this thing, we could only put in about 3% uh, of the donor mitochondrial DNA into the, into the zygote. That's what we used as a model system. And then when we looked at the animals uh, that came out of that, it was the distribution was stochastic around 3%, but a very large proportion completely lost it uh, in the first generation uh, of animals. And only very occasionally would it be, in quotes, amplified, but it wasn't truly amplified. It was just a sampling problem. It was really a stochastic problem. So I think if you're only carrying over 
uh, a few percent in, with any of these procedures, that's probably pretty irrelevant in my view in terms of transmitting it because it'll probably be completely lost in, in a subsequent generation. Um, did we see anything weird in these animals that we made that had two kinds of mitochondrial DNAs? No, but Doug Wallace is going to tell you something different, uh, I think, in a minute, uh, in the animals that he had. They look perfectly healthy. We did it in two different directions with two different genotypes. There were a hundred differences, point mutations between two mitochondrial DNAs. We could go one way, one the other way. There was no difference in fertility. There was no difference in anything that we could see, but we didn't do any sophisticated behavioral testing on them. Um, so maybe I'm just going to stop there because I've almost hit my 10 minutes. I have four minutes left. Um, and I'll ask, I don't, I'm not sure if you want, I don't know what the ethical implications are of this. We've just done kind of the science. I think the science behind it is pretty solid. Um, I think it's pretty clear that you can actually do the technique. The safety issue is another issue. If you're going to transfer chromosomes that aren't in a pro-nucleus, I mean, I guess you have to be pretty concerned about the safety issue of that. I mean, the people that have done the macaque studies and the studies that have been done in Newcastle, they say it's safe. Um, you know, they, what they say and what happens, I mean, the mistakes can happen in those things. But it's very clear it can be done, I think, and I think it's very clear in my mind, at least, that you could prevent transmission uh, of mutations to the next generation. It does look clear. <laughs> 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 Thank you for that. <laughs> So, so, Eric, since you're our first... One, one, one other thing I should add, though, is that not all, not all mutations behave equally. So some, like the tRNA lysine mutation that's associated with, associated with this MRF phenotype, behaves like a completely stochastic mutation, as far as I can see in all the pedigrees. It's beautiful. If you plot everybody's... Uh, the difference between what kids get and what their mom gets, it's a perfectly Gaussian distribution around a mean of the mom. Other ones, like the ATP6 mutation, that uh, Mitchell was talking about in terms of uh, PGD um, sometimes goes, well, looks like it goes from zero to 100 in one generation. So it looks like there could actually be, in the context of that mutation, some positive selection for, in quotes, the bad guys. But we don't really know what's um, filtering out the truly bad guys. And that's actually one other point I forgot to make. There's pretty good evidence for purifying selection. I mean, Doug had a, a, a nice animal model of that. Um, and a lot of the data from Niels Larsson, Jimmy Stewart uh, in, uh, in Sweden now at Cologne, shows, I mean, I think unequivocally, that really nasty mutations are filtered out uh, in the germline. And it's only a very small proportion that squeak through um, whatever that mechanism is that cause almost all of human disease. And we really don't understand that. That's, that's one of the great unknowns, I think. And because we can't really make, we can't really tailor make yet uh, mitochondrial DNA mutations to put in exactly the human equivalent in an animal model of what we want, uh, those questions have been difficult to address. So thank you. So before you sit down, because you're the only one who's finished with your light still green, I, I wonder if you could just... <laughs> I wonder, Two minutes. Yeah, so I, I just wonder, uh, curiosity-wise, when you go back to the bottleneck issue, yeah. so you're, you're getting down to 200 co effective copies, mm -hmm. so to speak, or... That's physical copies, actually. If you, if you measure it, it's, a, I, it's really difficult to work with single cells, I think. But, and there's a lot of variability when you do that because there's just a lot of technical issues. But, I mean, what the Newcastle group measured, what we measured, was on average 200 copies of mitochondrial DNA. The, the effective size of the bottleneck, if you just look at it in a, in a statistical sense, doesn't necessarily measure copy numbers. It just says, if we were to take a sample of mitochondrial DNAs from a mom, uh, and we look at all their offspring, how big was that sample, statistically, just based on, on variance measurements uh, from mom to offspring? So it's not based on any physical reality necessarily, but it turns out that it's roughly the same physical reality that we measure. So I, I guess my question is a little bit, so that's around implantation, so that's around the first week of... I'm post talking about primordial germ cells. Oh, the primordial germ cells gets down to 200, forgive me. So I guess I was going back then to when you were actually in the embryo, mm -hmm. right? And so you were saying that you start off with 200,000 copies and you distribute to 50 or so 100 like, copies per I cell. There's 14,580 cells or something in an early one. I can't remember the All right, good to know. So, <laughs> so I get, known. Okay, good. So I guess my question is placenta versus embryo. Is there any data that says 
I don't know. What we you're did, biopsying and what we, it's representative I mean, of? We did a study in these mice early on looking at the blastomeres and looking at polar bodies. And what we showed is that the first polar body predicted exactly what was in a blastomere. Closer to the microphone? I'm sorry. The first, first polar body predicted exactly what was in the embryo. And we could take all eight blastomeres from an eight cell embryo and we got basically identical answers. So the variance was extremely small in mouse models of this. And I know somebody's done, uh, has looked at that in the macaques, but they've been in embryos that have been uh, manipulated. So these are not embryos that are manipulated. So there's very good evidence that the, the, if you sample one blastomy, you've sampled the embryo, at least in mice. And I think that's probably going to be true in humans. Vamsi wants to be in here. I want to make sure that we also make our way through the other yeah, Until his we'll, light is we'll ready. reserve then. time at the end. <laughs> but if you want to be oh, right on, that's ready. fine. Okay. Oh. Quick, quick question. So up until the point of implantation, you said that there's no replication of mtDNA. Is, yeah. do, do we know if there's transcription or translation uh, off of mtDNA up to that point? Um, I'm not, I don't think we do, MC. I don't, I'm not sure that anybody's really looked at, the, at that. Um, because you'd have to get, no, nobody's really looked. You'd have to isolate those embryos. Uh, I guess you could do it if you had some way of embryo culture and then, you know, label and in, inhibit cytoplasmic translation. It would be a little bit technically challenging to do that experiment. But I, I don't know of any evidence one way or the other on that. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. So we'll go on. 